can look, then one can listen. Look, sir, if I want to understand what you are saying, I must listen to you. I must listen to you with affection, with care, with attention. Then I want to find out what you're saying. But if I say, yes, I agree with you, I've heard this before, or you're saying something new which is impossible, you're not listening. One of the most intriguing discoveries in modern science is the fact that there is nothing in this world that even approaches what might be called truly solid. We speak of solids, liquids, and gases, but these terms describe superficial rather than basic properties of matter. All matter, regardless of its state, is composed of invisible particles called atoms, which in turn are composed of other particles. The air we breathe, though invisible to us, is just as real as wood, or metal, because it's made of the same fundamental particles. It is the arrangement of these particles and the forces that bind them together that give to a substance its special properties. If we bring a piece of steel close to a magnet, we say that the steel becomes magnetized. But what is it that actually happens? If we place the steel inside a coil of wire connected to a high gain amplifier, and then bring the magnet close to the bar of steel, we can hear something that suggests movement inside the steel. Listen. We think of a piece of steel as being solid, and according to our definition, it is a solid. But the popular concept of what makes a solid is certainly a false one. This piece of steel and any so-called solid substance on this earth is almost entirely empty space. If we could eliminate the empty space in this piece of steel, all that would remain would be a tiny bit of matter so small as to be invisible even with a high power microscope. This concept of almost unlimited empty space within matter is comparatively new, but it is the very cornerstone of our knowledge in this atomic age. Atoms are not solid. Instead, they are tiny solar systems composed of infinitely small particles revolving at tremendous speeds and bound together by enormous forces. And like our solar system, atoms are almost entirely empty space. For the moment, let's forget the forces within the atom. Thinking only of the particles and the empty space around them, Science knows no reason why I couldn't take this so-called solid steel bottle and just throw it right on through that wall. Except this, we've tried it and it hasn't worked. If I were to attempt to run through that wall right now, all I'd get for my trouble would be a good-sized lump on the head. But that which would prevent my body passing through the wall would not be a collision of particles, but rather a collision of forces. The same forces that make an atom bomb. And if it were not for these forces, my body could go freely back and forth through that wall, just as though it were not there. It is within the realm of scientific possibility that there could be two worlds coexistent, occupying the same part of space at the same moment of time, each world just as real as the other, with its mountains, valleys, rivers, trees, and people. And that one world could pass freely through the other world, neither world being conscious of the existence of the other world, if you grant just one thing. Atomic forces within the material substance of these two worlds that are not mutually interactive. What do we mean by this? Let's see. Here are two pieces of steel. Their appearance is quite similar. But a magnet will reveal a basic internal difference between the two pieces. This one, of course, is picked up, but uh, this one is unaffected. This piece of steel is non-magnetic, stainless steel. Of 
course, we all know that other metals, such as brass or aluminum, are not affected by the magnet. But a ring made of aluminum is something else. It can be suspended in air by the electromagnetic force of what is actually a transformer. The ring being in effect a one turn shorted secondary. A smaller ring will react even more violently. Here is another ring. This one made of a material we say is non-conductive. And it is completely unaffected. Here is another example. Several thousand watts of pop were involved in that spark. If we replace the spark gap with a copper coil, the same power now flows through the coil. It's invisible, has no effect on many substances, but it can generate a lot of heat. Wood, paper, things that we think of as being quite inflammable are not affected at all. However, a piece of steel wool bursts into flame instantly. Did you ever fry an egg on a cold stove? It's no trick at all to have the right equipment. This is a cold hot plate. And because it's cold, you can make it out of wood, if you like. Just be sure that there's a coil of wire inside and that you connect that coil to a high voltage alternating current source. The rest is easy. As long as we're being different, we'll use motor oil instead of Crisco. The egg fries very quickly, but the stove remains perfectly cold. In fact, if you wish to keep it handy, you can fry your egg on the morning newspaper. With a gadget like this, you can get up in the morning, sit on the stove, read the morning newspaper, and fry the eggs in your lap. Another example of the fact that physical forces can be quite selective in their effect. All of the examples which we have cited thus far have been in the physical realm, and of course have been limited by that fact. We can, however, cite examples that transcend the purely physical and clearly demonstrate the reality of these two worlds. It created so much joy for the world, and the system, meaning the record companies, totally took advantage of it. But this is very important, what we're fighting for, because Tired. I'm really, really tired of the manipulation. I'm tired of how the press is manipulating everything that's been happening in this situation. They do not tell the truth. They're liars. And they manipulate. They manipulate our they manipulate our history books. The history books are not true. It's a lie. The history books are lying. You need to know that. You must know that. These beautifully crafted walls in Machu Picchu are strikingly like the buildings that surround the Great Pyramid in Giza. Here too we see the symmetry in the building style. This has got to be more than a coincidence. In all these ancient sites, we find the same building techniques, the same huge scale of building, and the same precise orientation with the compass. Just look.
This is where the comparison with the beavers falls through. Because even if they build the same dams, they don't line them up over thousands of miles. Even if these ancient people did communicate, it wouldn't explain why the sites are on the same straight line and why that line is at an angle of exactly 30 degrees to the equator. And the mystery doesn't end there. In Mexico, just like in Giza, there are three main pyramids. They are the Sun Pyramid, the Moon Pyramid, and the Pyramid of the Feathered Snake. And just like in Giza, the main pyramid is precisely aligned. What's amazing is that the Sun Pyramid, like many other constructions like it, were built to indicate precisely the phenomenon that we call the equinox. However much the experts deny it, the similarities between all these ancient sites are striking. Hieroglyphic writing, mummified bodies, great astrological skills, earthquake-proof construction techniques. We need to look harder at these questions if we're ever going to find the real answers. Any material that man, mankind hasn't managed to invent, a single material which lasts as well as this stuff, it's amazing, but we haven't done it yet. These ancient sites are full of questions and mysteries that conventional archaeology cannot answer. And anyone who steps away from the usual explanations is dismissed as a crank. But the questions remain. Because rock carving cannot be accurately dated, there are no definitive answers. If we want to solve these mysteries, we need to keep an open mind. The Great Pyramid at Giza is in the center of all these ancient sites. Maybe Egypt holds the answers. It's time to go back to the pyramids, remembering what Sherlock Holmes taught us. When you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. In Egypt, a researcher who wished to remain anonymous gave us a trail to follow. The ancient Roman, Pliny the Elder, tells of arguments about who built the Great Pyramid. But of all the accounts that Pliny writes about, only one has survived. Herodotus' account is the only one we have left that tells us about the building of the Great Pyramid. It shows how little we really know.
In 1859, an Englishman, John Taylor, discovered if you divided this dimension by this one, you got pi, the mathematical formula. This caused controversy at the time. Some people thought it was an accident. Could it be a coincidence that these particular dimensions give us pi, one of the building blocks of mathematics, science, and engineering? I asked my anonymous Egyptian researcher if he could explain why these dimensions were significant. Because the half perimeter is the biggest horizontal visible dimension and its height is the biggest vertical invisible dimension. Pi is not the only significant number in the Great Pyramid. If we look at the dimensions of the various parts of the pyramid, each part can be multiplied by a whole number to give the total height. The surface of the four sides divided by the surface of the base equals the famous golden number, one of the key principles of aesthetics and design. The golden number is unique. These equations work with the golden number and only the golden number. The golden number occurs all over the natural world, in the shapes of plants, in astrology, in the proportions of the human form, in the proportions of great art. The golden number appears to be a constant in the universe. By dividing the half perimeter by the total height, we get the golden number squared. And the golden number occurs again and again in the Great Pyramid. Ancient builders worked with a precision that modern architects would envy. Their achievements have never been better. All this can't be chance, because everywhere you look in the pyramid, you come across pi and the golden number. It's found in the visible pyramid, and it's there in the upper chamber. This is a controversial position, and many in the archaeological establishment would strongly disagree. It seems extremely unlikely that Egyptians knew the value of pi. The golden number was also a relative unit featured in pyramids and their temples. But it never occurs in Egyptian calculations. So this knowledge of the golden number is very surprising. Many Egyptologists say the ancient Egyptians had no great mathematical skills, and all this number stuff is just coincidence. But here's a mathematician's opinion. We meet it so often that the probability of it being due to chance is nil. It is infinitesimal to me. Frankly, it's like zero. It stands to reason, even for a mathematician, meaning someone who can assess probability that the volume of that pyramid was picked because of its numerous possibilities to reveal through it the golden number. Oh. 
I think that ancient Egyptians were aware of the golden number. They couldn't have come across the resolution each time, especially the perfect one. They had to possess that knowledge. It's not in their culture to divulge it. They kept it secret. And the best way to keep a secret is not to convey it anywhere. It's no secret. It's simply closed. Geometry is the sensitive part of mathematics. And just like mathematics, it's a language. The golden number or golden ratio often occurs in classical architecture. We can see it in great buildings like the Parthenon and many of our medieval cathedrals. Like the Great Pyramid, this cathedral shows the equinox. This circle indicates precisely the position of the sun on the horizon during the equinox. Even more extraordinary, the shape of the Great Pyramid is hidden in the facade of Strasbourg Cathedral. Even though, when the cathedral was built, the Great Pyramid was still partly covered in sand. The builders of the Great Pyramid certainly knew what a meter was. They used it with pi and the golden number to determine the length of the cubit. But the mysteries don't end there. The anonymous researcher we spoke to earlier had been plotting the ancient sites on a world map. This strip that stretches from Easter Island to Giza is actually part of a 25,000 mile long circle. This 100 kilometer wide circle goes through many significant ancient sites across the globe. In Peru, it passes through the Paracas drawing. The Nazca tracks, Olantitambo, Machu Picchu, Cusco, Taxiahuman, and the Paratuari pyramids. In Africa, it crosses Mali and the mysterious Dogon lands, where they knew the stars Sirius B and C before any astronomers. Algeria and the Tassili Nijar with its painted Martian god. In Egypt, it goes through the Siwa oasis and its Zeus Amon temple and through the Great Pyramid at Giza. Next it crosses Petra, Ur, where Abraham was born, Persepolis in Iran, Mahenjo-daro in Pakistan, where the unreadable writing was found that is so close to the writing on Easter Island. Then it crosses sites that have always been known as the homes of the gods, Kachuroho in India, Paye in Burma, Sokotai in Thailand, Angkor Wat and Prahihar in Cambodia. And it ends with the most isolated and mysterious place on earth, Easter Island. There is an astonishing accuracy to this alignment. Although many of these sites date from different times, most were built on the ruins of more ancient sacred sites. At some remote point in the past, someone had built a series of sacred sites on this line, circling the globe. The circle was as long as the equator, but the mystery doesn't end there. If we take this circle as an equator, then its north pole will be located here. And the triangle formed by this point, Nazca and Giza, exactly matches the shape of the Great Pyramid. The distance between Nazca and Giza equals the distance between Teotihuacan and Giza. The same is true of the distance between Angkor Wat and Nazca and between Mahengo Dara and Easter Island. The distance between Easter Island and Giza is 10,000 times the golden number. The distance between Angkor and Giza multiplied by the golden number equals the distance between Giza and Nazca. And the Giza-Nazca distance multiplied by the golden number equals the Nazca-Angkor distance. A 
As surprising as this seems, it ties in with some earlier discoveries about the pyramids. In the 20th century, an astronomer and priest, Moreau, showed the meridian passing through the Great Pyramid divided the land of the Earth into two equal surfaces, making Giza the central point on the planets. Twenty centuries before him, Agathocides argued that the Great Pyramid was the geographic reflection of the Earth. And the length of the two sides of the Great Pyramid was also the average distance a point on the equator moves through space in one second. This is a given in physics, indicating the speed of the rotation of our planet on its axis. Every aspect of the Great Pyramid is stuffed with significant numbers that connect to the world. But many people find this hard to believe. Skeptics argue that this could all be just chance. But the number of amazing facts that have to be explained just keep growing. Once again, we have to return to the pyramid for further investigations. Let's take another look at the inner chamber. Each building block here weighed as much as 40 cars. Each block had been fitted precisely. They are perfect vertically and horizontally even though the builders didn't have the tools to check their exact measurements. Why did the Egyptians build with such precision? There's a reason to bring huge granite blocks 500 miles to Giza. Granite has one unique property. It doesn't change over time. Its dimensions remain the same. This means the Great Pyramid secrets could be transmitted through the ages. My anonymous friend drew two circles, one outside and one inside the base of the pyramid. He subtracted the length of the inside circle from the length of the outer circle. Take this figure to a physicist. That's odd. That's the speed of light. No doubt about it. This is the speed of light in millions of meters per second. This is the number from the pyramid. I have nothing else to say. Scientists may find these truths unpalatable, but they are hard to deny. Are they embarrassed by these revelations? If we look at the Great Pyramid without prejudice, with a fresh eye, and when you're a physicist, you measure and you notice many things like that. Coincidences, I suppose, but so many coincidences with such a big object, it's very disturbing. Many experts would argue there's nothing extraordinary here. They say the Great Pyramid really was Cheops' tomb. Even though no one can explain how it could have been built in 20 years, they say if the Great Pyramid really is signaling the equinoxes, if it really contains pi and the golden number and has a cubit value that relates to these and expresses these values in meters, it's all just chance. They say the striking similarities between the ancient sites thousands of miles across the world is just another coincidence. If these sites line up in one line across the world, that's a coincidence too. And if interesting numbers continue to crop up, in the distances between the places, and if the Great Pyramid contains the number for the speed of light, it's just chance. How many coincidences have to happen before you look for another explanation? This is starting to look less like chance. Or maybe there's a rational explanation for these mysteries. Maybe it's not chance. Maybe once we look beyond the conventional histories, there's a new truth to be discovered. If none of this is coincidence, 
then who is responsible? Given the possible natural disasters that could occur on Earth, for example, continental drift, volcanoes, or major meteorite impacts, there's nothing to keep us from saying that more advanced civilizations might have lived on our planet. So it's possible a more advanced civilization once lived on our planet. This is a bold and radical conclusion, and of course it raises more questions. Why are there no traces left of these people? If, for some reason, our civilizations were to disappear, many things would withstand centuries, but not millennia. Only a few big monuments would last. Monuments, I would say, like the big pyramids in Egypt. What then is left of this advanced civilization? We know they measured the Earth. They built a scale model based on it, in the shape of the pyramid, full of numerical significance. They built a series of artifacts along a line that circumnavigated the world. There must be a reason for all this. Everything we have discovered about the Great Pyramid must have been put there for a specific purpose. We are very close to discovering the truth. Megalithic sites occur all over the world. Is their placement random? Or does the location of these sites reveal yet another hidden layer of ancient knowledge? One thing I found looking at uh, different megalithic structures over a few continents and numerous places around the world, overwhelmingly these places, the pyramids, the stonehenges, etc. of the world, were placed on ground where an unusual type of geology naturally concentrates the regular daily natural electromagnetic fluctuations that occur everywhere on the earth each day. If you go into England, for example, um, the, the ley lines that cross uh, England, the Michael line, which is hundreds of miles long that crosses England, um, that carries this energy along that line. It will therefore generate uh, electric currents in the land called telluric currents in the straight geological sense of that word. And um, those occur everywhere on the planet. But we know that this ley energy, this subtle energy, passes along these lines. There are certain special types of geology that will magnify those several fold. And that's where we found the megalith builders preferred to put their, uh, their monuments. And typically where lines cross, where you get more than one line intersecting, uh, temples were often built. These are called conductivity discontinuities, which sounds highly technical, but it's merely the place where one area of ground that has a, a good ability to conduct electricity meets another area of ground that has a lesser ability to conduct these natural electric currents. The Chinese had the same tradition. They call them dragon lines. It was illegal for a commoner to be buried on such a line. A king had to be buried on such a line. They put palaces there. There's a whole series of sacred sites they're always built on lines like this. I want to say in this area about the uh, location of temple. You have to have a, a symbols appear on the ground. When it's uh, uh, seen, then this is the place where people naturally come to get more uh, healthy energy from that spot. You know, energy pumps from the earth. And it appears as though they 
were attempting to control the flow of this energy and use it for their own purposes. The key hours, unfortunately, are the pre-dawn hours. If you really want to study this, you've got to get up at 3 and get out there very fast. Um, that's because the, uh, the energy that is involved in these sites, that's really fueling most of it, originates with the daily changes in the Earth's geomagnetic field. Uh, it's strongest during the day, weakest at night. And in the hours leading up to dawn, the weaker field lines now come roaring back to closer to full strength very quick. It's the most dramatic time in terms of change of magnetic strength per hour. It's the most dramatic time of the day. And wherever you have uh, a changing magnetic field occurring, you are generating uh, electric current in anything present that will conduct electricity. It's a simple principle of physics known as induction, and it's a universal. Normally, in everyday life, we don't ever see large concentrations of this energy. Normally, it'll show up at the say, at mountaintops, at sacred sites. You'll feel a certain calm, a certain peace. Sometimes people in those places uh, report mystical experiences. They'll see into some other dimension, okay? They'll see into some other time. The Chinese have known about this for a long time, and they call it qi. The Hindus, in their ancient texts call it prana and the yogis with the maintain a very ancient tradition um, use it it affects a, a variety of different processes electricity magnetism has a strong effect on that so it modifies all the other laws of physics when you look back on how sacred sites were chosen and uh, buildings like the pyramids were were constructed the suspicion arises that they understood quite a bit more about this stuff than we do, and they may have been using it in their engineering. Then the megalith builders designed these structures and, and then built them in such a way as to further concentrate those energies. So they definitely seemed to have known what they were doing.